My name is Lori Pirro, and I'm an artist and an art teacher in southwest Missouri in a rural town. And uh, about two and a half years ago, I was introduced to biochar by um, one of my best friend's husband, and his name is Doug Brethauer. My friend's name is Anne. And they invited me to their home to talk about biochar and to show me some of the models that Doug had created out of like a coffee pot and other metal things, paint cans and, and different things. Um, but he wanted, we were talking about the Amazon Indians and how they had created very fertile soil with, um, by sequestering carbon and mixing it with the, the soil. And so he asked me if I would be interested in making a clay version of a biochar. And of course I said, yeah, it would be really awesome. And so that's what we talked about that night. And I drew up, while he was talking, I drew up some plans for a prototype. And this is the one I constructed for him. And it's really small and it, um, it puts out about as much energy heat as a candle, but it worked. And that was what we were interested in. So I went ahead and made more. And I want to show you, I've showed you how to light them several times on YouTube. And then I thought, well, maybe I ought to show you the piece by piece so that if you're interested in constructing one out of clay, you can. Um, as far as I know, my students and myself are the only people in America who make them out of clay. So that's, I would love to encourage other people to do it too and, and for you to experiment because we are the mavericks of the biochar sphere. And so anything you do that's different than what I'm doing and, and is successful, I would sure be interested in knowing about it. Um, my friend Doug also wrote a book called Make Smoke, Burn Smoke, Biomass Gasification Primer, Smoke on Fire. And his book is available. I'll post the link either in the information section of this video or um, in the comments for you to be able to purchase it if you're interested. It's at a very reasonable price and it has a lot of really cool information in here. It features the Terra Preta Authentica, which are the biochars that I've made out of clay. And it features um, how to create a, a gasifier to run your vehicle on or with uh, rather than using gas and that's kind of cool and um, it, it shows you how to make gasifiers out of um, metal also it's just a really awesome book for people who are interested in alternative fossil uh, and alter alternative fuel sources and I want to read a little piece off the back of it that I thought was really poignant <clears throat> that Doug puts I remember nuclear energy being implemented despite safety concerns on the promise it would deliver electricity too cheap to even meter. Vehicles powered by hydrogen fuel cells have been just around the corner since my first driver's license almost four decades ago. Pon pondering my son's energy future began the search for a reliably better way. The astounding truth is the better way surrounds us. The sun's energy is stored in nature's own power plants to be used in accordance with man's wisdom, or woman's wisdom. <laughs> this energy is widely dispersed and freely given to those who will roll up their sleeves and rather than wait on the next heavily subsidized and marketed fairy tale to emerge from the pipeline. So let's explore the alternative. Make smoke, burn smoke, and start a revolution. Doug Brethauer and people like him, David Yarrow, several other people who are heavily involved in alternative fuel sources are going to change this world for the better. And that makes me very excited. So um, this is a, a wonderful book to have if you're interested in alternatives to fossil fuel. Um, okay, to start out, you're going to start with the holding vessel for your fuel cell. And it can be a cylinder, or I keep having dreams about cubes, so my next biochar will probably be a cube. Um, this holding vessel, this is one of the latter models that I made, and it's, it's just a cylinder without a top and a bottom, and then you place air holes, intake air holes around the bottom, so that when it's sitting on a flat surface, it'll still have some intake air to um, fuel the charge, uh, fuel the fire. And I believe you can make this out of any form. I've made them. This is another fuel cell that I made. I think this is probably just the third one that I made. And it has a smaller base and a larger top for the fuel cell. Um, and also here are the air holes that I placed in here. And it's made out of the coil also. Um, the coils are melded on the inside because I just thought that the, the raw coils were more aesthetically attractive and that's why I left them out. And I threw some glaze on this one and sort of embellished it with different kinds of designs. 
Um, I wouldn't advise putting glaze on the fuel cell or the the chimney because those things stay very hot and the clay, the um, glaze would be running on those. But it does pretty well on this. The cool thing about the the holding vessel is that it stays relatively cool to the touch, even to the point where you can move it if it's burning. Uh, it's not a lot of fun, <laughs> but you can. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Let's see. So your, your holding vessel needs to be a form that doesn't have a top or a bottom and has intake air holes around the bottom. And then your fuel cell is, the size of your fuel cell is determined by your holding vessel. It needs to be half the size of the holding vessel in height. And um, eventually I want to start making larger ones. This fuel cell will burn for about three hours, but I'd like to create one that burns for about six hours. That way I can come home from work in the winter time and um, supplement my heat by firing up the biochar and then six hours later when it's time for bed I can dump it and snuff it and go to bed. So I'd like to increase the size. And I also um, want to increase the size of the lip and put handles on it. Because this is what you have to remove. You remove the chimney and then you remove the fuel cell and dump it and snuff it. And I want to be able to pick it up more easily with handles. So I think that's one of the modifications that I'm going to make in the future. Now when you make your fuel cell, you want to make it out of two pieces, not three. And I'll show you why in a moment. But you'll make, you'll make your base first. And I made it with a slab technique. And slab is just rolling it out with a rolling pin. But in order to keep the thickness of the slab consistent, you take two dowel rods that are the same thickness and lay them on either side of the clay and then roll your rolling pin down that way over the dowel rods so that it'll maintain a, a consistent thickness. Um, and so you make your bottom and you decide what diameter you want and then you cut it into a circle and then you go ahead and roll out your body and your lip. And once you have it the size that you wanted, you go ahead and form it to whatever form you want it to be and you slip, score, and meld and attach it to the bottom and then you create your lip just by simply folding part of the top over and then smoothing it all up and, and um, I, I usually take little coils and put them in here and strengthen it that way and here's why the this is probably this the third fuel cell that, or second fuel cell that I made and I was so proud of this fuel cell because I had taken great pains to burnish it which means to polish so when it was in the leather hard stage when it was still kind of wet and cold to the touch and not dry and ready to fire, I took a, a really nice piece of smooth wood and burnished the whole thing and it was beautiful. And it's so I wish you could feel it. It's very smooth to the touch and just feels wonderful. And I was so excited about it. I thought this is going to be the greatest fuel cell ever, ever, bar none. And then I fired it all up and about 20 minutes into the fire, I heard this explosion <laughs> and I ran over there and ah, it was smoking everywhere and it had blown itself, blown the body completely off the lip. Well, I've, I've got dirt in it now, <laughs> and that's on me, but um, yeah. So it blew itself completely off the lip, and the only thing left on the holding vessel was the lip, and that was very disappointing. So you definitely want to construct your base or your body and your lip with the same piece of clay. Don't try to attach one. It's not going to work. Or it might. I don't know, but it didn't work for me, and I'm not doing it again. That's all I've got to say. So when you do have this perfectly constructed and, and burnished in every way you want it to be, then you go ahead and add your primary and secondary air holes and you'll put seven, that seems to be the magic number, in the bottom and then all underneath the lip, all around the cylinder, you place as many as you can, usually about a half inch apart. The air holes on the bottom are half the size as the air holes under the lip and that's something to be aware of and to remember. I have a tendency to kill fuel cells that are made of clay. This is the only one I still have living at this point except for the one Doug has. He takes a lot better care of things. I'm a little bit more rammy, I guess. I've even stuck. I don't put a hot. Don't put a poker in there when it's red hot and start. You'll knock the bottom out of it. I've done that too. I've dropped him one time. I had a scare. My CO monitor. I thought it was going off in the house. So I. It, what happened was a little puff of smoke came out. So I ran over there like a freak and grabbed it out of there and started running through the house and all the smoke's going everywhere. And I got and I was going to dump it out in my garage. I have a a wood burning stove out there so I was gonna dump it out there right as I got it was raining like crazy just big sheets of rain and oh it was a nightmare and I the minute I got to the stove and got the stove open I dropped it in the ground and just killed it 
So my son said, well, Mom, maybe you need to make some out of metal. And so we found this metal piece, and this fuel cell has, I have not been able to kill it. It's awesome. It's just a can, a canister of some sort, and we put um, seven air holes in the bottom and put air holes all along the top with a nail and a hammer, and it works beautifully. And it's, I've never had any problems with it. I cannot kill it. And then we had to kind of beat this so it would go into the holding vessel. But it works. It works beautifully. But there's just something about clay, the naturalness of clay. And even when it burns out, it still radiates heat, and that's kind of cool. So I really like to make them this way. Okay, so I've told you about the holding vessel. We've talked about the height of the fuel cell. We've talked about how the seven holes that you put in the bottom, around the bottom, need to be half the size of the holes that you put underneath the lip and around the um, cylinder. We've talked about burnishing to make it stronger, uh, to compress the clay and make it stronger. We've talked about how you make your cylinder or your fuel cell with two pieces of clay. You make a base and then you make your cylinder and the lip needs to be part of the base or of the body or else it's liable to blow completely off the lip, the body will, and that's not a lot of fun. And then we need to talk about the chimney. <clears throat> this chimney was constructed with a coil method and I'm not going to do that again. The first one I made was with slab. I rolled it out into a slab and then rolled it up and slip scored and melded it the way I wanted it and then attached it to the base of the chimney. Don't call this smokestack biochars if lit properly. Do not smoke. And that's why we're able to use them in our homes as a supplement to heat. Uh, if yours is smoking, you're not lighting the charge completely on top and you need to get some propane and some alcohol and do it again. Or my brother-in-law, Dave Pogue, introduced me to these um, cedar sticks. Man, they, pr they are a great catalyst to start a, um, a biochar. You can hold a lighter to, or even a match to one of those cedar st sticks and they just, pff, they're awesome. So that's another form of, or a catalyst that you can use to light your biochar to get it lit more quickly and efficiently. Okay, so on the chimney, the diameter of the chimney hole needs to be half the size of the diameter of the fuel cell. So if this is six inches, this is gonna be three inches. That's all you have to remember. Plus, the chimney needs to be about a fuel cell and a half in height. Now, it can be larger because you can take this and light it and then put a piece of ductwork in it and point your energy anywhere you want it, your heat, to your, funnel your heat anywhere you want it with a, a piece of ductwork. So, larger isn't bad, but you need to have it at least one and a half times the fuel cell for it to work properly. And this does keep it from smoking and keeps it lit really well. The chimney does. Um, eventually I want to make the base of the chimney larger so that you can create like a planche cook surface. I think that would be really awesome and it will help, you know, uh, Doug has videos on his page, Freedom Biomass, where he shows you how he's boiled water and he times it and stuff like that with the biochar. And I want to be able to do that too. Um, and like I said, I am in the future going to construct my chimneys with the slab method rather than coil. I burned this one probably about 30 burns and then one night I noticed a crack um, happening down here and um, at the end of the burn when I went to remove the chimney this part came off in my hands. So I'm, I'm not going to, trial and error, I am not going to use the coil method for the chimneys anymore. I just don't think they're structurally sound enough. I want a piece that's supposed to be one piece to remain one piece. And the best way to do that is to create with a slab. Um, okay, so I know I've probably left out some things. I hope not. I hope that this gives you a better understanding of what the different pieces are and what goes into making each piece and how you make them and, and why. And um, I hope that you'll be inspired to create your own. Like I said, we are the mavericks of the biochar-sphere. Bio and so whatever we do is, um, it's probably not been done before, which makes it pretty exciting. Um, and I talked to you about how I want to increase the surface here so we can cook on it. I talked to you about the handles. You know, when Doug and I were talking about biochars, and he said, wouldn't it be cool to go back to a time when to be wealthy meant that you were full? You had enough to eat, so you're a wealthy person. 
how simply beautiful is that? Um, and when I was talking to the kids about biochar, that's another thing. I took these into my students and I said, this is a biochar, and I explained it to them and we fired it up and they were like, when can we make one? And I love that enthusiasm. Young people are so, they're so not jaded and they're so excited about things that are, uh, that they find interesting. So I have, I and myself and my students are, are turning these out every year when we have the clay to do it with, and that makes it exciting. But I told the kids what Doug had said about returning to a time when uh, to be full meant you were wealthy, and they said, oh, Miss Perro, it's like back to the future. These are the flux capacitors of modern day. <laughs> and so um, I thought that was real. That's what the kids started calling them, flux capacitors, and I just thought that was a really neat thing. i got to dismiss this. We're on low energy here. Okay, so if you have any questions when you're making your own, and I encourage you to do that, please leave them in the comments. And if I can't answer them, I'll find someone who can. And um, just um, happy biochar making. And remember, biochar, the char, enhances the soil that provides the food for us to eat and be self-sufficient. And it also provides 50% of the 50% of the, the burning goes to the char and 50% goes to heat, um, energy, and um, it's just a really beautiful thing to be more self-sustaining. I don't know if a lot of you remember, but back in 2007 we had an ice storm here that rendered us powerless in my particular home for 11 days. And at the first night we were, or the first couple of nights, we were burning 65 candles in the living room try and with blankets everywhere trying to stay warm. And uh, everyone in my family no longer can stand the smell of um, vanilla and cinnamon <laughs> as a result. And then we finally got some kerosene and lit our kerosene heater. Um, but it is a good thing to know that if the power goes out, you can still heat your home and you can still boil water and you can still cook and you can still maintain some of the activities that you normally do when the electricity is working. The grid could die. It's not. It's a possibility. Um, storms can create a power loss. That's definitely a possibility and most of us have lived through situations like that. So what this does is it enables you to be more self-sustaining. and. I, that's a beautiful thing in my world. Um, it would just be so nice not to have to be so reliant on outside sources. And it would also be so nice not to be so reliant on fossil fuels when we don't have to be.